That's part of the reason why. You know, Congress said to NASA, can you engineer us a $1.2 billion launch vehicle for $100 million a year? And NASA went back at them and said, oh, yeah, the, you, you want that moon rocket thing. Yeah, that's going to, yeah, that we'd need like $1.2 billion a year to get that done on any reasonable schedule. And Congress said, oh, well, can you do it? We give you $200 million. Is that enough? And NASA said, uh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, we can do that. Knowing good and well that if they said no, the program would be cut. And Lord knows they tried. So, yeah, it's kind of cool that they're addressing all this in Moon to Mars. That's, that really makes me happy. Just bring back Ares 1, please. I'm actually going to read through this later. I'm going to read through that later. That's pretty cool. All right. So let's get this done right. I'm going to make two sets of hinges here. Two, three, four, five, six. There we go. Hey, what's up? What's up, Toast? <laughs> How are you? Goes pretty in-depth into the needs, goals, and objectives. Yeah, cool, Novus. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good stuff. That's what we want. So the close hinge I want in the further, the further bearing, right? So, and then I'm gonna rotate these upside down so they ride correctly on this piece. All right, that's in the correct position. Now, C95, what I'm doing here, I don't know if you're still here. It, it, we were talking about the hinges riding around a little bit. What I'm doing is instead of making it a bunch of spheres stacked on top of each other, I'm putting two of them together and we're inadvertently kind of making this a cylinder. There we go. All right, so this is using the upper hinge on the close side and then here it needs to use that hinge, so. I will take these, right? There we go. And then these ones right here. So I'm just taking the time to line everything up here. This is a little bit tedious, but yeah, it will pay off.
Yeah, Pacey, something like that, dude, yeah. Because of this, because of your shuttle build, I can now never hear this music without thinking of the shuttle. Uh, you're welcome. It makes me happy that I can still cruise through the uh, Kerbal Editor. All right, cool. So let's go through, make sure we have everything set. Enable same vessel collision, enable same vessel collision, enable, okay, good, cool. Let's bounce back over here. Hey, Paximus. <coughs> All right, we can get rid of this piece. That was just for measurements. All right, save. What is going to spin on that monster of a hinge? Mechazilla, nearly. I want Mechazilla. Okay, so hit one, undo that, undo that, and let's see where this gets us. Why is this one drifting and that one isn't? Huh. Okay. That's drifting around. Interesting. Hmm. It's stressed. It has a test in the morning. Yeah. Oh, well, there's your problem. Well, there's my problem. <laughs> That's used, that one's using the two outer hinges and that one's using the two inners. I did this backwards. That one up there was super solid though, which is kind of cool. 
Um, all right. Yeah, that one up there, the, the I-beams in the fuel tank were bending. Not that, though. In fact, if we grandparents strut some of this stuff, or just grandparents strut the fuel tanks, that'll eliminate the bending. So then we can see exactly what the drifting is doing on the hinge. Good example of how even here angles matter. So yeah, the reason why I'm super over engineering these hinges is because this is the one that, these are the hinges that, you know, if we get to that point that they're going to catch the damn booster. So these things are going to be soup. They're going to need to be super strong. But see, using these as a cylinder actually really, 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 really makes this nice and strong. Okay, cool. The next thing I'm kind of thinking is just maybe just move, spread them apart as much as we possibly can. Like if I put this one up here, and then we put this one down here as like far away as we can and then move the move the hinges into that position i think you know i'll skip a couple of tests here and we'll just go right to that one Cool. Alright, let's just make sure that everything is action grouped correctly. I don't think my hinges are evenly placed apart. But, well, we'll find out in a second here. I think that's because of how the spectrometers are, but... Hey, Trucker's mother, what's going on, dude? It's just a hinge, Fun Pants. It's a door hinge, that's all. It's just we don't have a door hinge in Kerbal that's strong enough to move rockets around, so I'm making my own. It's just made out of parts, that's all. The robotic is only there to govern the motion of, of it, like where it goes, because that's the part that, that moves, right? I'm making a hinge by using RCS and the, the spectrometers. I'm making it, it's just a door hinge, that's all. 
So let's hit one, unlock that, unlock that, and then disconnect the struts. Let's see, these things moving around. All right, let's uh, put the damping up. Damping all the way up, go that way with that one, and go that way with that one. See, it's just a hinge. Is KSP2 getting better? Yeah, sure, man. Can you strut the hinge base? Yeah, mutter. Yeah, see, the hinge actually isn't moving at all. It's what's attached to it that is, interestingly enough. Cool. All right, I'm calling that good, man. We just, let me let me change a couple of things here and there. What CPU bottleneck were you talking about earlier? The terrain, the procedural quaternon system that KSP1 and KSP2, believe it or not, they both use it. Um, yeah, it's basically bottlenecking the CPU because it's unoptimized, unoptimized graphics. It's bottlenecking the CPU, believe it or not. So I'll put two FLA5 adapters in here and we'll put two hinges up to that. From there. Are you gonna have the SRB on a hinge too? No, no, why would I? So the arms can move off to the side to pick up the booster. They already can do that. Both hinges moving in the same direction, dude. Yeah, it already can do that. That's how the real one works. They have the hinges on top of each other. So there's two hinges top and bottom here. And there's two hinges top and bottom here for the chopsticks. And they both are on the same rotational point, Creeper. So, you know, if they're both on the same rotation point like this, they can do that. They can do that. Or they can do this. Understand? Yeah. I, I remember, dude, I spent too much time looking at NSF footage. Uh, trying to figure out how the frick that worked. It's on, yeah, it's actually on a gigantic kingpin. It's on a big kingpin. It's on a big kid. It's on a kingpin.
Interesting. I mean, I basically have done that, but now I'm kind of like wondering. Yeah, you skateboard skateboards are in fact on kingpins as well, Urban. Yeah, that's that's true. <laughs> You're not wrong, man. Let's see if that changes anything. Me smirt. Yeah, skateboards have a kingpin. That's how you can steer a skateboard without any steerable wheels. The whole axle steers by pivoting on a kingpin that's um, tilted. Been watching for 30 minutes and I still have no idea what the goal is. Sajet asking me usually helps. Just on a side note, I'm not trying to be I'm not trying to be uh, a jerk. Yeah, if you ask me, dude, I'll tell you. See that thing right there? This thing that picks up Starship. This thing. See this dark thing right there? That's that picks up that. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make that. Yeah, SpaceX integrates their the first and second stage together with this giant crane and catch tower thingamajigger. I want to make it. So I'm testing out hinges for the chopsticks to be able to open and close, dude. Yeah, I'm trying to build it in KSP-1. The reason why I'm using KSP-1 is because we can't really do it in KSP-2 because we don't have robotic parts, you know? Yet. See how much it bends. But really what I'm looking for here is... Yeah, the I beam, the I beam is bending. It's not the hinge though. The hinge is actually holding that pretty well. So if we do this, put it to the test there. Yeah, move this a little bit. Not too bad though. They stacked it today, Katra. Yeah. Did you get those parts sorted? I did, Death, yeah. Yeah, I did. Anyone know the name of the song? Yeah, I timestamped it for you. If you set up a cow that makes it move really slow, it'll stop the sway. You're right, you're absolutely right, Cat. 
I'm purposely inducing load on this thing. I'm making it swing around on purpose. To basically shock load it up. I just want to see how much it moves around. Still bouncing around just a little bit, but it's actually pretty freaking strong. All right, so here's what we're gonna do now. No problem, Liam. We're strut from the outer tank to the hinge help. Yeah. Yes, it would. I mean, mutter. We actually have to re reinforce this joint right here. Let's see. When was KSB1 first released? 2011, money. Birdman, you get that thing I sent you? Birdman, you get that thing I sent you? You didn't send me something else, did you, or not? Please, for the love of God. Birdman, you who are you are X the Eliminator? Ready? See what happens. Pfft. That's now, why would you think that? That's actually really strong. It's holding, but reloading will cause some issues. Doubt. Hybrid tech, man. It'll force the same vessel collision. will force the hinge back into its, uh, back to the state that it's in, dude. Yeah, because the collisions, it'll detect the collisions and it'll bend the hinge back into position. Yeah, hybrid tech, Luizo. Really good for that, dude. You, I thought you knew that, though. Also, no, you're safe for now. Oh. Okay, now with gravity. That's not that much deflection considering we have nine tons hanging on the end of one G11 hinge. It's pretty freaking good, dude. Do it, fizz warp and stop. All right. Heck, we'll even do we'll even do fizz warp there. Ready?
Yeah, Fizz Warp was the only thing that really broke this thing. And I'm not planning on Fizz Warping this thing any time in the future, so. Hey, Roadrunners, what's up? Have you, ever have you had a chance to look over what you sent? I have not. I haven't, dude. I'm sorry. I've been quite busy lately. Like, there's a lot of stuff on my plate, dude. Like, I've had to stop playing certain games, like, on the weekends, dude, so I don't work myself to death. Hey, boo. What's going on? Fizz Warp simulates a reload. False. Louise, are you just making up stuff now? Just, like, making stuff up? Dude. Watch. You have to make the camera go inside of the nose cone. Clip inside of the clip the camera inside of the nose cone. Inside of the nose cone's glider shape twisted and you'll be able to select the probe core. Yeah, monastery. Fizz warp in KSP1 is just asking for trouble. In fact, we just fizz warped and it's gonna eventually mem leak the game. Hold left alt, twisted. So watch, Luizo. This is hybrid tech, dude. Just, we gotta wait for them to settle down. Got you twisted. All right, watch. Ready? So let's leave the scene and we'll reload. I'm running the most updated version, Shadow Wolf. I have Parallax. Uh, Parallax, Astronomer's Visual Pack, and Waterfall. Yeah, just some visual mods. And then Kerbal Constructs and KRPC. Alright, so let's go back over here. Reload. Watch. Make it clap. Yeah, right. Clap on, clap off. The clapper. This is fun. Glad to see you working on Starship stuff. Super excited to see the orbital test so close. Me too, man. It kind of crept up on us, huh? Yeah, see, Luizo? Works just fine. Yeah, no problem. Hinges still work. Works exactly the same. That's hybrid tech, man. I don't think you were here for this part when I did this stuff. See? So these are simulating chopstick arms, guys. That's what's going on here. That's why they are they look so beefy, you know what I mean? But yeah, we're holding that one hinge. <clears throat> this is the power of hybrid tech. That one hinge is holding nine tons out on the end of the stick here. Those tanks are full of fuel. See? See what I'm talking about? 
That's really strong. I mean, I'd be curious to do some math out here. We are... So that's 1.5, 2... Uh... <clears throat> So 1.5 plus 0.75. We're 2.25. We have 9 tons. Actually, we'd go off center of mass. We have 9 tons that that's 3 meters away from the pivot point with the acceleration of gravity pushing down on it. So that means there's 9 tons of force pushing down on each one of these singular, singular hinges. If we had two of them, if I had another set up here and another set down there, we could even make it we could make it even stronger. Hypertech is not possible in KSP2 for multiple reasons. No robotics, no same vessel collision, and the physicsless parts drip or drift around in KSP2 for whatever reason. What's the length again? Three meters. These I beams are 1.5 meters, so the center of mass of this is three meters almost exactly from the pivot point. Nine tons pushing down, three meters, three meter distance from pivot. So that's the moment pushing down on it. It's pretty damn strong for what it is. I mean, the hinges are still drifting just a smidgen. I'm not sure if we can chase... I'm not sure if we can or sh we should chase that... Chase that extra bit right there. Now you just gotta build all your rockets at 89 degrees. Like I said, I'm not sure how we are gonna how we should chase the last bit out of here. It's 9,000 kilos. What are the RCS balls attached to? The RCS balls are attached to that piece, the, the moving part of the hinge, the plus minus part. Actually, if we attach some to parts that are further out on the hierarchy, that actually might, and we have room to do that, that actually might make that stronger. You know what? I'm actually kind of curious to go and see. Nutcracker? No, I'm building Mechazilla's arms, dude. So, what happens if I took an RCS ball, took two here, and took two here, right? And then I took one of these, right, and we moved it over here to this hinge. And maybe another one to the other hinge over here.
So this is putting some of the hinges, attaching them to the, uh... Like the tanks now have those pieces, have hinges attached here. So it'd be, this is kind of the equivalent of running a strut out here. Okay. All the action groups transferred over. Let's try it again. Hundred ninety five thousand two hundred ninety one foot pounds. Yeah. One heck of a cheater bar, indeed. <laughs> it's not even fair. It's not even fair. Look, that's almost no deflection, dude. Unfrickin' believable. May I paste the song? No. Pretty much no deflection there, dudes. Yeah, hybrid tech and stuff would be awesome, hallucinations, yeah. So once again, I'm using same vessel collision on some science parts and some RCS balls to make hinges. And the hinges work with the robotic hinges, but the robotic hinges, everybody knows, they're flimsy, they're like spaghetti. They dangle around all over the place, it's really annoying if you're trying to do something like Mechazilla. But yeah, that's hybrid tech for you, for you dude. I don't want to say it, but that looks like a pee pee with ball. How, how did, Firework, how did you get that from this? How do you, how did you look at this and go, ah, yes, pee pee. What's the... uh, this is just royalty free synth wave off of YouTube, Adam. It's good music. I don't I don't I don't understand. My brain is kind of crap today, must have taken a dump. So uh, yeah, about sank my boat today after a log ripped the propeller off. What were you doing? Yeah, that's so this is super strong, dude. Black 
Collects just so so thirsty. They thirsty and they don't know how to. They thirsty. You know what I'm saying? They thirsty and they don't know. They don't know what to do with that. You thirsty. What's going on? You damn thirsty. Take your thirst somewhere else. <laughs> what are you doing? The theory I'm trying to build. <clears throat> trying to build the catch arms that SpaceX uses with Starship. And this is basically just putting a fuel tank on the end of the hinge. It, like. You, everybody knows KSP-1, and in, in KSP-1 and 2, stuff is kind of noodly. It kind of wobbles around a little bit, right? It's because you know what to do with your thirst. I will let you know what to do. You keep your thirst out of my damn chat. I want candy, bubblegum and that. Damn it! And like 10 people ignored us when we were waving them down. All right, so Nathiri, check this out, dude. Um, so you, this is strutted together right now. And like I said, any part in KSP is super, super bendy, right? Now watch this. Once again, we have a full fuel tank here hanging out on the end of a hinge. Now watch, ready? Oh, I got to tell it to hold it in place. Hit colliders. There we go. And see what is ah, that top one? I think I I think I bent one out of position. Ah, crap. Hang on. Let me let me re let me revert. I I broke it. Um, how do you tell them to hold? Well, I have to trigger an action group right here. I have to use an action group that tells these things to collide with each other. It basically enables their hitboxes so they can, they can collide against each other. That's what keeps this thing so strong. So you saw I didn't do it and I undid it and the thing kind of weeble warbled around. Probably hit a water logged log. Yeah, no, I got that. Thank you, drummer. Hey, drummer, what do we do with this, dude? What do we do? What do we do with this? I don't know. I don't know what to do. It's stressing me the frick out, dude. I don't. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't know what to do with this. Like. All right, so I have action group one enabled. Let's get that open. Let's get that open. Let's go here like this, disconnect that, and disconnect that. See, they don't move. They, I mean, don't get me wrong. They're, they're sagging just a smidgen, right? But look, we can swing these things around, no problem. And the thing more or less just, I mean, it's still sagging a little bit because gravity, it's bending just a smidgen, but yeah, it doesn't, doesn't really do anything. Yeah. And I want to point out, dude, that this thing is being, it's out there on one hinge. One hinge is holding up that, those nine tons, right? It's pretty dang impressive. Now, how do I do it? Well, it's these pieces right here. So I use the spectro bearings or the spectro variometer no as a housing and then I use an RCS ball as a hinge. You can see it's moving around in there. I can, so we, I use the colliders from the game to make hinges, right? And see that one is kind of moving around. It's, it's not exactly what we want it to do. It, but um, you get the idea. See, that's what makes it so damn strong. I'm using hinges. See that thing moving around in there? I mean, we could swing these things around no problem and it'll, it's just fine. It doesn't bend. Panther gifted a sub to Luizo. So, in the theory, what I want to do, the reason why I need to make the hinges so damn strong is because we need to catch a first stage with this thing. Or at least I'm going to try to. Or try to build something like it, right? 
Or we could just mess with Starship. Even then, these could be used for Starship's flappy wings. You know what I mean? We could use it for the flappy wings. Nine tons with a three meter lever is like 270,000 Newton meters. That's a lot of force pushing on that thing to keep it nice and straight, Raid. Yeah, it's pretty good, man. That's pretty strong. Like, if you look, this thing, it is deflecting just a little bit, but even just a little bit of deflection with pretty much the equivalent of like four or five semi trucks hanging off the end of this thing that on just one simple I beam like that is pretty damn, that's pretty damn good. Would it help to move the Kraken Tech hinges further away? If we space these out further, Phil, yeah, but that's about as far spaced as I want them to. How much could it hold up? Nine tons is fine for what this is right now. I have no idea where this is going to lead us, but I'm excited. So we can make super strong hinges, right? And now, you know what we should do? We should go back to that Starship model and we should uh, retrofit it with better hinges. Kind of want to do that. I don't want to do that. All right, cool. So that this I'll call this one a success. That those are really really strong. But I have a cool idea now if you guys want to see it. Hey, boss, what's going on, buddy? There, there's a way to make it even stronger if it doesn't need to spin too fast. I was making it spin fast on purpose to, to stress the hinges out, Louisa. So let's see this thing right here. Oh, yeah. So this is my Starship prototype here that we built a long time ago. Stop it with all this cool stuff. Sorry. How nice is the SPH camera? I love it. So, I can take a hinge like that and for instance, Starship's flappy control surfaces. We can make a better flappy control surface here. One that won't break, one that's super freaking strong. We're just not exactly sure how we're gonna do it just yet. Bear with me. Yeah, I did give this RCS. How did I make this? Oh. Everything's attached onto a girder segment. Okay. I stacked two hinges on top of each. EJ. No. The pins, Erudite. It works, but it's not strong. Discovery, go at throttle up. It ain't strong, Luizo. It's not strong at all. Actually, those are... Those wings are much too big for Starship nowadays. Starship does not have wings that big. They actually made the wings a lot smaller on the 
newer versions of Starship. Probably trying to max inputs without getting me. Ah, yeah, that's why they're double hinged. Ah, that's a good point, Aquilux. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. That's, yeah, that's a smart way of doing that. I'm thinking about how we're going to do this. How are we going to make this thing fly? Hey, Max. 65 month resub. The double hinge head is there for control inputs, L Force. It's so you can. So I can have yaw control and also pitch and roll control. It's a compounded input. So, like, these. These inner hinges are for folding the hinge up, and the other ones are for like yaw movement and whatnot. It's actually, that's actually a really smart way of doing that. Now, I'm not sure if my hybrid tech is needed here. I don't, now that I'm looking at it, but I do know that these motors don't really have a lot of power. Tiny Victory says hi. Hello, Tiny Victory. Rear pitch control, Tesla motor clock. I did overclock the servos. Interesting. I don't think we need that much wing over the rear, guys, so... Um... Losing power? No, arrow forces were overcoming the um, the wings, dude. Honestly, we don't need that big a rear wing.
Neat, Sawyer. That's cool, man. Let's see what it does with the tiny wings. I made a hybrid actuator using pistons. It had limited moment movement range, but was standing the aero forces really well. Cool. Wasn't that an April Fool's joke? I don't, I don't know. get my control actuators up. No, not the yaw. We need forward pitch and then rear pitch control. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. Not good. I gotta restart Kerbal. Uh, the fizz warp is very... Doing that fizz warp with the hinge test a second ago really made the game choppy. It's hard to see what's going on. Yeah, that thing came out of the sky real quick, almost too quick. All right, here, let me save that and let me give her a quick restart. Yeah, it's the fizz warp, Aquilux. There's a mem leak in the game. When you fizz warp it, it there's, yeah, when you fizz warp it, mem leaks the game. So it'll get worse and worse as you play on.
Yeah, I know you can average input, Sokolex, but that's... I, I've known that that's a thing. I did this this way for a reason. Uh, uh, yeah, whatever I was trying to implement here in the past, I, I, did th I did it this way for a reason. I've known that you could average inputs on cows since messing with the... Like, <clears throat> what were we doing? Trying to make helicopters or something. I've known that for a while. Will 6600k 4.5 gigs be enough to sufficiently run the game? Kerbal? One? Yeah, sure. Why not? Two. Yeah. Yeah, it should be fine. Okay. Let's see what we got. Controllers are up. All right, let's do this. Ready? KSP1 development is stopped. <clears throat> yeah, it's done. Let's get a little ways up in the air so we have time to figure out what the fuck's going on here. good enough. We still need some fuel to land. Hmm. 
Yeah, this is uh, not ideal. Where's the kaboom? Hey, you didn't get you didn't get the kaboom that time, pal. Not bad, man. Your wings are slightly above the center line of the craft. It'll make it so it won't flat spin. That's cool. That actually worked. All right, neato burrito. Only could just get a payload bay going for this thing. Okay. Cool. That's awesome. So 95, that tells me that SpaceX has their center of mass bias just a little bit on one side. It's a little bit off balanced and the center of mass is more towards the bottom of the vehicle, which would solve the same problem if I'm understanding that right. So how about... He may not be here, he realized he has to dip. Oh, okay. If we offset. I think the flaps are a bit too tall. They're left over from my other flaps. These control surfaces are quite big for what they are. We could always get rid of that. If we did, I'd have to move this whole mechanism downwards a little ways. And when we do that, it seems to break the entire thing. Maybe because of this? Nope. Doesn't like that. Do you know what sort of weight this thing can lift? Uh, with three shuttle engines, Cat, it can do a good deal, but I don't have a payload bay for it. There's no payload bay that we could conceivably do when we made the fuselage out of fairings like that, you know what I'm saying? He needs super heavy. It's not 5 meter diameter. The tanks inside are 5 meter diameter. A scaled starship in KSP wouldn't have 5 meter diameter tanks, guys. Remember, Kerbal is about two-thirds real scale. So if Starship is nine meters in real life, a scaled Starship for KSP would be six meter. Hence the six meter fuselage. That's why I built the fuselage of Starship and the fuel tanks, quote unquote, out of fairings. And there's just one big fuel tank buried in there.
Oh, I thought you were doing KSP scale. I'll be right I'll be right back dudes Hey, illness. Seems so suffered an anomaly. I'm uh, I'm fighting a migraine right now, guys. <laughs> I'm fighting a migraine right now, and yeah, chat's not making it easier. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Look what I saw during my flight to Mexico, 60 to 80 miles away. Hey, the VAB. Cool. Need supercraft. My ears are on and off. I uh, yeah, I guess, man. I just don't understand why you'd ask a question and shut your ears off immediately after that.
Something's going under the 33 Raptors. Huh? Well, I'm gaming and watching. Am I weird? Yeah, I'm going to say asking a question and then not listening to the person answering you is not only super disrespectful but a little bit weird at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and say yes, that's a little weird. Stop hurting yourself. I I don't I don't know what to do here, man. <laughs> EJ hurt himself in his confu in in his confusion. Yeah. 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 Maybe a little bit. <laughs> the hit points have gone down. Hillness, you want another garage stream, dude? You got it. I mean, if you guys want, uh, we'll do one later, like in three or four hours from now. Oh, my sir. Okay, I got you. I got you. All right. So, Starship is good, and we need to go make another. We, we want to do another Mechazilla here. Bring on the garage streams, baby. Uh, let's play Kerbal, and we'll do it. We'll do it after. <clears throat> so, that Starship prototype is working, but uh, yeah, it's. Let's go back over here. So we have absurdly strong, we have our really strong hinges now, which is good. But yeah, we're gonna have to make the sticks. Garage streams are a nice change of pace. I mean, I'm not sure what we need to do out there, Hillness. But I do want to play KSP, but then again, the patch is still a little ways out, so that's why, you know, like... I mean, we could. I'm sorry if I annoyed you, I do listen, but I was truck driving in-game. Sorry. That's... Sorry. You didn't annoy me, Erudite, but... <clears throat> Dude, you're, you're young, and it's... It's better to learn the... It's, it's better to learn this sooner rather than later, dude. If you ask somebody a question, you're asking for their time. Don't waste other people's times. And I'm not speaking just for me. That's something you should do in life. Don't waste other people's time. Don't do it. And now the thing is, the thing is, dude, is that as you get older, <clears throat> or when you're younger, I should say, it's hard to tell when you're wasting people's time, especially in this day and age. It's hard to tell. Like, that's something that people always told me when I was younger, but it never really made sense to me. Never made sense to me until I wasted someone's time and somebody yelled at me for it. Like, slacking off at work when I was a lot younger, right? So, learn to not waste people's time. So, I get it, you're driving your truck, but if you're going to ask me a question, right? And I'm going to answer your question with a good response, and then you say, wait, what? Whoa, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do in that? You're wasting my time now. Right? I try to give everybody equal opportunity to answer and ask questions. But yeah, see what I'm talking about? I'm not annoyed. It's just, it's a little bit disrespectful. You know, that's something you got to learn, dude. You got to learn not to waste people's time. That's not, that's not, that's not a good thing. And don't talk to someone face to face while doing stuff on your phone. Oh gosh, don't even get me started. Yeah, boss, my buddy DevRijo says you play racing games from time to time. He's, t he's teaching me KSP, but garage racing is always fun. Uh, boss, I have a rig behind me. I'm taking a hiatus from racing right now just because I have a lot on my plate. 
I'm working on some other background projects, which once again, start time is delayed by an hour tomorrow. I have a meeting that I need to uh, attend to. <clears throat> I have a meeting with some very important people. You know? You catching up on your mega project? So yeah, I mean, so yeah, fellas, like, uh, yeah, uh, I haven't been racing much lately, boss. Uh, but yeah, I usually we we would we'd do it every Friday. We'd race every Friday, like um, sim racing in Assetto Corsa. Yeah, but I still do Saturday GTA racing, but that's more arcadey stuff. But yeah, 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 we do. Don't worry, we'll get back to racing sooner rather than later. I'm just I'm in the middle of something right now. It's awesome you have a racing rig. I built it, boss. Yeah, I built it. Uh, well, it's I didn't exactly build it. It's half I half built it. So, I um I have a racing rig, and it's a Maruda. I think is what it's called. It's just some Amazon special. It's not really. It's Chineseium, dude. What I did was instead of going and buying a seat, I have a car. I got a car seat from a Mark II Supra, a bucket seat. And I made custom brackets to put an actual car seat on the rig. And then I strengthened it up with some... I strengthened up the rig because it was flimsy as hell with um, with some um, bar stock. Well, hall, yeah, tube stock, I guess. It's not tube stock. It's, it's more bar stock, but whatever. Uh, it's basically some metal brackets to hold everything together. And then for whatever reason, I had grade 8 bolts lying around. So my racing rig is grade 8. So... There's that. <laughs> Tube. We've been trying to get Friday Night Racing back up and running. Just need to flesh out the details. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's just yeah, dang good. I'm I have too much on my plate, dude. I had to I have to like at the end of the day, I'm just so freaking tired. I have to like I can't I have to eliminate some distractions right now. Because it's, I, I was telling you guys about that the other day. I have to eliminate some distractions, dude. Because I have to, dude, I have to get this stuff done. You know? That's super sick. I love that. Right on, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, just keep it classy in my, keep it classy in here during the day, dude. Because I'm trying to teach people about stuff, you know? Uh, but yeah, right on, man. Square stock. Yeah, I, I'm blanking on the name because my brain is killing me. It's all good, boss. It's all good. But yeah, tell Dev thank you for thank you for recommending me. I, I do appreciate it. I'm glad I'm glad you dig it. I'm glad you're into it. Hey Mick Controller, what's up? How's it going? I have a question. Can you please teach me how to match a proper orbit with a far distance planet like Duna or Moho from Kerbin? Sure, man. Yeah. I mean Okay. Yeah, that's fine. So, okay. Me controller, can you? I have a question. Can you rendezvous two crafts together? So, like, if you have a space station and a, you launch a rocket, can you get the craft to dock to the space station? Yes. Okay. So you know how you get to you. You know, if you have a spacecraft in your space station, right? And your spacecraft is in a lower orbit than your space station, and you're boosting up to said space station, right? That's what you got to do, right? You got to do a little bit of a rendezvous burn. Yeah, KSB1 hired. I wanted to go mess with hybrid tech. Um, so, you, you know, you've gone through basic rendezvous. You, I mean, I'm familiar with that. Okay. <clears throat> all right, here, check this out. So, all right. So you have your planet, right? And then you have your target, which is up here. And then you have your orbit, right? So what you do is your vehicle's here, your target vehicle's here, and you basically do a burn and then eventually you get up to it, right? And then you rendezvous somewhere over here. So basically what you gotta do here is you gotta you gotta mess with you gotta mess with calls with you got to get into what's called ideal phasing, all right? So if you have your sun right here, and then you have Kerbin around it, right? And then you have, say, Duna, right? Around that. Actually, hold on. Let me go blue right here. 
you have your Kerbin orbit, and then you have you have Duna's orbit around that, right? <clears throat> so you have to get into you have to get into ideal phasing here. So obviously, the best time to get from Kerbin to Duna, for the most part, for the most part is when you're closest, right? Because Kerbin is in a lower orbit than Duna is, or Earth is in a lower orbit than Mars, if you want to. So, like, if you have a bracket here and a bracket there, right? Because it's a... Earth is... I'll just I'll just use KSP planets. Because Kerbin is closer to Kerbal than Duna is, right? This distance is obviously... Distance from here to here is obviously less than distance from here to here. And because you're closer, Kerbal's further inside of the sun's grav well, it's going to have a higher speed than Duna. Duna is further out of the sun's gravitational pull, right? So its speed is going to be different. So would right here be the ideal time to go? No, not exactly. That is the ideal time to get to Duna from Kerbin, but... You don't want to be right here when the two planets are closest to each other, do you? No. You want to be going this way. You want to be going to Duna when they're closest, right? So enter what's called phase angles, okay? Phasing is basically the term... It's a term in orbital mechanics that basically says... It, like the, the plain Jane definition of it is B burn at the right time to be where the where you're... What, where with whatever you're trying to get to is going to be, right? It's basically making sure that everything's lined up. Think about it like uh, in a shooting game, right? You know, you have, a, you have your gun and, you know, you, you see the target over there and then you aim down the sight, right? You aim down the sight and then you have to lead the target, right? Leading the target is phasing. That's, that's what it is in spaceflight because you have to lead your target. Just like, just like shooting or archery or whatever, right? You don't want to be... You don't want the two planets to be close to each other, because if you tried to go this way, the sun's gravity is going to pull against you, and you'll end up doing something like that. You don't want to do that. That's not good. So what you need to do, say Duna, for instance. Put Duna right there. And now, here's what we need to do. Here's the trick. You want to find the ideal phase, right? Where does Kerbin need to be? Does Kerbin need to be over here, over here, or over here? Let's think about this, right? You don't want it over here because Kerbin's going faster and you don't want to have to go against the rotation of the sun. Going this way would cost insane amounts of delta V. Obviously, this is not going to work. It'll cost bajillions of delta V to be able to grab, grab shot off the sun to get to Duna because Kerbin's going to be over here and you're, you're going to have to put your PE so close to the sun to deflect you out to Duna because it's going to get over here. By the time you do this type of thing, it's going to end up being over here. Really, really, that's really, really delta V intensive. You'd need hundreds of kilometers a second delta V to do that. So it's not that one. It's not that one. It's over here. Now, why is it over here? Well, Kerbin's going faster. Dune is going slower. And if you make a, if you do a transfer orbit, right? <clears throat> if you put yourself into an orbit that with or an eccentric orbit I should say if you put yourself into eccentric orbit with the lowest point at Kerber's, Kerbin's orbit and the highest point at Duna orbit like that just it's elliptical right so it's not a perfect circle you're going to be slowing down all the way out to Duna the reason why is because you're at the highest point in your orbit if you have a planet and your orbit is like this right up here the AP is the that's the slowest part of your orbit and pe is the fastest part of your orbit that's what periapsis and apoapsis mean slowest and fastest speeds or furthest point away from celestial body closest point right so now that goes back to the question where does kerbal need to be well here's the quick here's the quick and easy way take this distance right here Times it by two, go this way. Right? That would be your ideal phasing position. Now, obviously, Kerbin isn't over here. 
So take this line and wrap it around. Wrap it around here, like this. Basically, that might be a little bit too far. If you took this line and you could match it to Kerbin's orbital path, right there, give or take. So you want Kerbin to be right here. If Duna is in the 12 o'clock position, right? And you have 12, three, six, and nine. You want Kerbal to be between the one and the two o'clock position. One and two, right? That's where you want it to be. Basically double the distance of the difference in altitude above the sun, but behind it, right? Now, that gets you your ideal phase. That's the ideal phasing. That's what's that's what's gonna make it cost the least amount of delta V to get from Kerbin to Duna, right? Everything goes this way in this. Everything goes counterclockwise. Well, most orbits go counterclockwise. Kerbin and Duna both go counterclockwise. Let's just leave it at that. There can be orbits that go this way. That does not happen in KSP. It happens in real life, though. Next question. When to burn? <clears throat> well, right here is the ideal spot for when you need to burn. Now, you gotta, we got to get into something called ejection angle, okay? Ejection angle gets to be a little bit complicated, all right? So... It's not as complicated as you might think, but bear with me here. So let's just let's do something like this. Let's we have another diagram over here. So <clears throat> you have your planet. Let's just say you have Kerbin, right? And then you have Kerbin's orbit. That's its orbital path, right? And I just put some concaveness to it right there to make it look like we're actually orbiting. So this picture over here is basically a small picture of that, right? Every planet, every planet has gravitational pull. The gravitational pull is basically represented, a good way to visualize gravitational pull would be a funnel. So if Kerbin, this is, so this is from the top, right? And this is from the side. If Kerbin is here and we were looking at this from a side plane all right how this works and keep in mind this is a 2d image that's trying um, it's a 2d drawing that's trying to image three dimensions it doesn't really work like this but if we could draw Kerbin's gravitational pull as a warp on space and time it would look like this so if this represents gravitational pull the closer you get to the center right the more gravity the more gravity you have the more gravitational gravity you have gravity is quantitative right the more gravitational pull affects your vehicle right so that's part of the reason why in a higher orbit you're further out of the grav well and you go slower as opposed to something that's going to go really really fast in low curve in orbit right so because you have that gravitational pull and that gravitational pull works in three dimensions you want to do this your ideal transfer orbit would look something like this right and once again you want your AP to be basically at the point where Kerbin and Duna are closest to each other like that because think about it, Kerbin's going to go faster. It's going to travel a lot more distance than Duna is because it's going faster because it's further in the grav well of the sun, right? So you do your transfer orbit here. <clears throat> now, this is all fine and dandy. That's good. But you also, now, you know, you have to take, we've this basically takes into account the grav well of the sun. But you're not taking into account the grav well locally of Kerbin or the grav well of Duna. Now, the grab well of Duna, that's pretty easy. Basically, when you get near Duna, right? When you get near Duna, what you need to do is... Basically, when you're coming in like this, you want to... Because you're coming from the sun, you're coming from inside of its orbit, technically. A good phase for Duna would be something like this. Right? As you pass through Duna's grav well, it is going to change the way you orbit. It's going to change your 
change your trajectory, right? This is this is a grab assist right here. Now, a good way to do this would be to, when you get right here, when you get to Duna's PE, you turn the rocket around and you burn with the rocket facing this way. Do what's called a retrograde burn. If you burn retrograde, you'll capture. And that's how you get that. That's the easy part. The hard part is when you leave when you leave Kerbin. That's the that's the difficult part. When you leave. Okay? So you're ideally in an orbit around Kerbin, a low Kerbin orbit like this. But you have to take into account. Remember that whole Gravwell thing, right? You gotta take that into account here. So, what direction do you want to go? Well, according to this right here, you want to go somewhere off in this direction. So, does that mean you burn right here? No. No, you do not. That's not a good time to burn. Because you're not taking into account, as you get higher and higher, Kerbin's gravity is going to try to pull you back in. If you burned right here, your trajectory is going to go over there. That's not where you want to do that's not where you want that to work. It's not where you want that to happen. You need to burn somewhere over here. Because if you burn somewhere over here and you burn prograde that way, you're going to your orbit's gonna end up looking like this. And you're going to get the proper trajectory that gets you into an orbit like this. A transfer orbit between Duna and Kerbin. This right here, the angle. The, so our ejection velocity, right? Or our ejection trajectory relative to Kerbin's trajectory here. The angle that this makes, if we draw a dotted line back here, right? And you make an angle here. This angle right here is called your ejection angle. See that? That's the ejection angle. It's the... Ejection trajectory relative to Kerbin's orbital plane, or orbital path, I should say. The ejection angle matters, and you gotta take into account the planet that you're leaving. Because Kerbin, while you're, you know, if you boost enough, and if you boost far, if you boost fast enough, right, or you, you burn far enough, right, you'll eventually just, if you, like, if I could just go light speed, right, like just zip off to light speed, we'll go off like that. And that works all fine and dandy if you can go light speed. Heck, if you had something like a, if you had something like an Epstein drive from the Expanse, you could basically just zip off and boop, you could go in a straight line. I know because I've done it in KSP one. Uh, yeah, that works. We've made we've made drive units like that before. But getting the ejection angle is really, really, really. That's what matters. That's what matters the most. That's what makes this difficult. That's what makes going from planet to planet super, super difficult. My phone has gone off six times in the time of this explanation. Six times. So, getting the ejection angle and taking into the count, taking into account the planet's local gravity as you're exiting its, as you're exiting its um, gravitational sphere of influence is how you do this right. The ejection angle is usually where people get confused, dude. Me controller, does that make sense? Nice, Doom. We are going to the moon! <laughs> yeah, no problem, DJ. How do you know when to burn to get a proper ejection angle? Well, yeah, that does. Thank you for the explanation. Right on. Is there supposed to be a specific angle? Well, a specific ejection angle would be... It depends on where you're going, guys. So, let's say we have Moho down here so say moho's down here there's moho's orbit you're trying to get to moho where does moho need to be so take this distance right times that distance by two draw a line out here imaginary right and then wrap that same line around here and that should pretty much get you where moho needs to be right where that's the right phasing for moho to get from Kerbin to, to Moho, right? That's the right phasing right there. So Moho needs to be down here somewhere. Now, 
Duna is higher than Kerbin relative to the sun. This is way higher than this, which is way higher than this. Now, ejection angle. Okay, so it matters. It makes a difference depending on where you're going. Now, when's the when's the right time to do it? How do you burn at the right time to get the ejection angle? Well, you can mess around with the maneuver nodes. That'll that'll help you. You don't need to you don't need to know the ejection angle. You just need to know the approximate spot, and then just tweak the maneuver node to get your ejection angle right. That's the easiest way to do it. Now. That's probably how you should do that, Zarbi. Just use the maneuver node, set Duna as target, and then just tweak it, right? So, or you could use a transfer window planner that'll tell you the right day and time. The, or you can guess it, I guess. I You just take this distance, times it by two, and then wrap it around there. That's That works every time. So here's the difference though. So if we were trying to get to Duna, right? We would be over here and we want an ejection angle that goes this way. The interesting thing is if you're trying to go to Moho, same thing, opposite side. You want to eject retrograde. So you'd need an ejection angle near 180 degrees. The ejection angle for Duna going forward is 30, something like that. Because your ejection angle matters if you're trying to lower or raise AP and PE around the sun. The MOHO orbit that you get put into with this 180 degree ejection angle right there, right, is going to look like this. See how one goes in a completely different direction than the other? Now, what does that orbit look like? That's just the dotted line that's showing the transfer. What does this orbit look like? It's something like that. Now, what does the Duna orbit look like? The Duna transfer orbit looks something like this. See what I mean? It's an ellipse that's going in a different direction than that. But yeah, taking into account the planet's gravitational pull that you're leaving and getting the ejection angle right is where most people get confused. But yeah, it's just phasing. It's just like rendezvousing two spacecraft together in space, only you're doing, you're rendezvousing, instead of rendezvousing spacecraft to spacecraft, you're rendezvousing planet to spacecraft or moon. Does that help, Micken? You explained to him the orbital inclination. Orbital inclination correction? Oh. Yeah, okay. Did you learn this in KSP? Uh, KSP is a good way of visualizing it, Fritz, but it won't teach it to you. Like, do I know the math behind that? Nah, not really. It's a lot of calculus. But uh, KSP, yeah, the KSP teaches you it for the most part, but it's not going to get you anywhere. KSP will make you as good of a rocket scientist as Forza is going to make you a race car driver, you know what I mean? That's right, self-synthesis, yep. All right, anyway. Man, now I'm, now I'm jonesing for a KSP mission. You got, damn it, how'd you do that?
Oh, nice. Nice, Adam. Yeah, that basically draws out the diagram that I was only a nice, a nicer diagram. Sorry, I didn't get the phase angle exactly. Actually, I did. No, I got the phase angle right. Yeah, 44.36 degrees. Yep, right between 1 and 2 on the clock. Yep, there you go. And then, yeah, if you wanted to go to Minmus, or if you want, not Minmus, if you wanted to go, like, to Moho, it's just this backwards. But, yeah, there you go. Yeah, Drux, it's, doing that is a lot of calculus. It's a lot of calc. A lot of calc. Yeah. Yeah, taking into account gravitational influence on something, yeah, that's, that's a lot of calculus, man. Will you continue KSP1 tomorrow? Yeah, no, no. Um... I mean, we could keep working on Mechazilla if you want. Yeah, that's not a problem. We have hinges that I think are strong enough here, and this is a good demo. So yeah, let's let's keep going. But yeah, if you guys got questions about you know, like flying and transfers and stuff, I've done that dude, done that way too much, man. I could yeah, it's no problem. It's really easy to explain. Um, yeah, it's just. Like, it's hard to visualize it in your head unless you, like, for whatever reason. But, you know, I find when I explain it, like, just take the distance and altitude and then go to behind and that gets you your ideal phasing. Really, really easy to understand that. How do I land on Jewel? Hopes and dreams, Urban. Yeah, no problem, Zarby. Do you have a disc? What do you mean? A Discord? Yeah, 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 Mike. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, pff, well, I fat fingered the keyboard there. Sorry, it's because my joystick is in the way. <laughs> there you go, man. There's the link. Nice joystick. Peep. Oh man, you guys make this a lot harder than it needs to be. <laughs> you love it? Has playing KSP1 made you miss some things from KSP2? KSP1 editor controls are superior, JSpeed, pretty much on all fronts. Uh, right now, at least. Beauty is, is that, you know, if I choose, we could have input on the design for the KSP2 editor. The KSP1 editor, the SPH editor, nothing even comes close. This is the best. It's so easy to make precision stuff with this. Um, however, things that I miss from KSP2, load times. The load times in KSP2 are so much faster. Um, yeah. Have you ever made a centrifuge? Yeah, of course. Yeah, Facha, I've made a centrifuge. Centrifuges are easy. Easy peasy. Uh, KSP2, if I had the isometric views with KSP1's editor, yeah, it would be the best. Um. Oh, nice, Liver. Yeah, reading orbit Orbital Mechanics for Engineering students. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That was a truck noise coming from Starbase Live. When are you going to connect a cheap Android tablet to the stream so you can use it like an Apple Pen to draw stuff directly on the screen you're in? I have a remarkable under my desk, Adam. I just never got around to it, dude. Too much stuff to do. <laughs> Too much stuff. And I'm fine with the mouse. Like, were my drawings not good enough? Like,
Like, I've been honing paint skills over years. I don't know why I would need the tablet, but... Alright. So... How are we gonna do the rest of this? So this is good, though. This subassembly is great. So here's what we're gonna do. Get rid of those. We can get rid of the ends. We don't need these anymore. We just need this sub-assembly here. Um, but it needs to have these struts in place. So let's remove all these struts from symmetry. There we go. All right, so now we have our trolley. We know this thing is super strong. Now we just gotta get away for this to, we have to figure out a way for this to ride on stuff. I'm not sure how we're gonna do that. Now, before I was using rollers in my other design. Rollers. Actually, another thing that I like from KSP2's editor is that storable sub-assemblies. Makes it really easy to mess with this stuff. But yeah, see, there's my old chopstick design right there. See, I made these roller bearing assemblies here. Those were kind of cool, but they, uh, a lot of parts. Could you just use RCS balls as sliding shoes? Yeah, I don't see why not. But we're rolling against a track that isn't necessarily physicsless, dude. That's the, that's the issue here. Okay, I see how I made it. I see how I made the tower. The tower is what was glitching out with us before. It's not the stack or anything. So, um, let me go ahead and make a new tower here. So, save this. And then just move this part over here. Oh. Sorry, it took me a second to find it. Right. Hey, Sea Kraken. Just got back from a trip to KSC. I got I got to meet and talk to Shuttle Launch Director Mike Lineback, which was really cool. Which went through a deep tour of Atlantis, and it was awesome. That's cool. Neat. I'm not familiar with Mike Lineback, but that's awesome, Sea Kraken. Alright, so I did this by using a plate, if I'm looking at that right. Uh, I used the tube. Yeah. Tube. Um, okay, so here's what we'll do.
There we go. Dude. What's surprising about somebody playing KSP? Oh, I don't know. He was the last shuttle director and launched 38 missions. That's cool, man. Alright, how are we gonna make this? Is KSP2 just too buggy? No! No, I wanted to... No, not... I mean, uh, yeah, it is a little buggy. Of course. Uh, but I'm not playing, I'm not playing KSP1 because I don't want to play KSP2. I'm playing KSP1 because the project that I want to work on right here is, uh, um, the project that I want to work on here, come on brain, jeepers creepers, uh, I can't do it in KSP2 because I don't have, um, I don't have the robotic parts. Is this related to the upcoming Starship launch? Yeah, that's why I thought it'd be cool to do a Mechazilla project, but we can't do it in KSP2, man. Yeah. Let it out. I'm sorry, trucker. My brain's not working very well today. Uh, my brain's not working real well because... Uh, I have this nasty migraine and it's really it's really killing me which really sucks man uh, my my streaming content with the exception of the truck stuff has been pretty weak lately and I'm not happy I'm not happy about that but yeah getting a migraine today isn't really helping me I can make a working hinge in KSP2 Awa, but uh, what we do with hinge, the hinge after that I don't I don't know Sorry to hear that. Yeah, it's it happens, dude. You have off days. I'm amazed I got through that orbital mechanics explanation without my brain going, you know? I'm a new reviewer, and I love your stuff lately. Even if you're, Even at your worst, you're great. Thanks. It was a good explanation. Right on, man. Um, All you need to say is I can't do the things with the things in that and we would have understood. Ibuprofen. Yeah, when I when I went AFK before, that's what I was doing, dude. Don't overbrain. Trusting the tower. We got to make it in sub assemblies, Aqualix. That's, yeah. It has to be in sub sub assemblies. So. Um, I'm not sure how we're going to make it so the rollers don't move around.
But RCS balls, like, clamping these three sides, I suppose that could work. Um, yeah, you just have one there, like... I'm wondering how curing the heat problem with Super Heavy with all the engines going. Um. Curing the heating problem? Um, the Raptor, the Raptors are, tr it's, it's, they're combustion chamber film cooled, throat film cooled, and nozzle film cooled. They can operate in close proximity to each other, and it's not that big of a deal. That's the, that's the short answer, T-Man. Will you make the pad a mobile pad? It needs wheels, right? Starship's pad isn't mobile, no. Yeah, hired him just I'm having trouble snapping into gear again. Damn it. Yeah, I mean Yeah, I collect they they could. Yeah, I mean I'm just Yeah, I mean that could do it, dude, but yeah. I see that, that's why I mentioned it. Just pushing myself too hard, man. Um, fellas. I mean, I could try to power through it. It's worked in the past, but yeah, this is not. Not doing, I'm not doing myself any favors right now. Um, yeah, dudes, I, I gotta, I gotta chill for a second. Um, what, what day is it? I don't even know what day it is. I mean, I've been, I've been burning the candle at both ends for like the past week, two weeks. I'm really paying for it now. <laughs> yeah, if I've been like kind of distant. Lately, that's what's going on. I'm just, there's a lot of stuff that I'm into right now. It's Wednesday. Yeah. Um. Let me let me look at the rocket launches. When do we got when do we got launches? So we Yeah, liver seven hours is nothing for me. I usually do ten hour streams a day. Alright. Alright, here's what we're gonna do. Here's what we'll do, dudes. But have you had a break yet? Yeah, I took a break to go get ibuprofen and it's not helping. <laughs> you know what we'll do? Let's uh, let's try something. You know what we'll try? How about we do space news? How about we do space news? Talk to me about rockets. Or And I'll talk to you about rockets. Let's bring back EJ's space and rocket review. Let me get another cup of coffee and we'll go. I drink some water. I drink this whole freaking thing, dude. It's not helping. So, for the people that don't know, I, I've i been focusing on playing a lot of Kerbal lately. And I haven't been doing truck streams. I haven't been doing racing, etc, etc. Um, what I used to do every day is have a 
four hour segment basically in the middle of the stream where we sit here and we just talk about what's going on in the industry i haven't done it in a little while <clears throat> a chocolate bar will help with a headache okay um cool cool let me uh let me take five here and um Yeah, Space News is a good brain break, so. Yeah, let me, you know what? I'll put on orbital mechanics. And we'll go from there. Okay, I'm gonna take a, a little bit of a break here. Um, actually, maybe not, maybe not the orbital mechanics video because it's 30 minutes long. It's it's fine, Erudite. It's fine. No need to apologize. Learn. Don't apologize. Actually, here. <clears throat> NASA released this video about Artemis 1 the other day. Uh, Alright. Here. What President Kennedy said Watch this. We choose to go to the moon and do other things not because not it's because easy right. but because it's I'll be back in a second dudes the cost of failure is much higher than the cost of scrubbing we we have an obligation to get this right this is a whole new vehicle a whole new technology a whole new purpose of going back to the moon in preparation to go to mars and yes it's hard the countdown to T minus zero starts approximately two days before launch. Teams inside the Launch Control Center have been working around the clock, powering up each section of the rocket and configuring the launch pad to support the 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust our moon rocket will generate at liftoff. It is a new creation. It is a new rocket and a new spacecraft to send humans to the moon. Um, on the very next flight. Today, we make history. With the launch of the most powerful rocket the world has ever seen, we are taking the first step in humanity's return to the moon. I can tell you there's an energy and there's an excitement around the Kennedy Space Center, I would say, across the agency and all around the Space Coast as we get closer and closer to this launch. This mission will validate that the rocket and capsule do perform as expected before future Artemis missions send astronauts to the lunar surface. We have worked really hard to get here. Uh, the team has done an absolutely outstanding job and we're up to the challenge and I'm really looking forward to a successful test flight. You are looking at the world's most powerful rocket and Orion spacecraft live on launch pad 39B. Artemis One embodies the hard work of thousands across the world determined to explore for the benefit of all. I'm Megan Cruz and this is NASA astronaut Kayla Barron. When I first walked up and saw the view from the desk here, I was just blown away. This is the moment when it comes to the countdown. You know, and then tension starts and, well, let's cross fingers, everything works well. The yeah, tension is rising and we are fully excited here. Over the past few years, teams have put in thousands of hours performing simulations and rehearsals to ensure that they are ready for this moment. As our zero hour approaches uh, for the Artemis generation, we do have a heightened sense of anticipation and there's definitely excitement amongst the team members. We've noticed uh, just the overall mood and focus within the team is, is definitely a positive one. Now with all systems configured correctly, the launch director gives the final go for liftoff. On behalf of all the men and women across our great nation who have worked to bring this hardware together to make this day possible. And for the Artemis generation, this is for you. At this time, I give you a go to resume count and launch Artemis One. This mission goes with a lot of hopes and dreams of a lot of people. It's no longer the Apollo generation. It's the Artemis generation. And that brings a whole new world of discoveries. T-minus 50 seconds and counting. The Space Launch System 
is now counting down to lift off of Orion on its maiden voyage to the moon. And here we go. Ten, Hydrogen one, burn off igniters three, initiated. Seven, six, five, four stage engine start. Three, two, one. And lift off of Artemis One. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. Well, if you're just joining us, welcome to NASA's Kennedy Space Center, where we just watched Artemis One launch, our first step towards our next adventure into deep space. With Orion off the ground, Mission Control in Houston takes the reins. Our nation is returning to the moon. And we have worked hard as a team. You guys have worked hard as a team for this moment. This is your moment. It is not by chance that you are here today. So I want you to look around, look around at this team and know that you have earned it. You have earned your place in the room. You've earned this moment. You have earned your place in history. The successful launch of SLS is just the beginning. Orion will spend the next several weeks journeying around the moon sending flight data back to teams here on Earth for real-time analysis. During its mission, Orion reached speeds traveling about 30 times as fast as the speed of sound. This dramatic uh, video of the Earth-Moon transit that took place showed uh, and punctuated the fact that uh, we were pressing away from uh, our home planet to a distance of some 268,000 miles away from Earth, further than any human-rated spacecraft had ever traveled, for a spacecraft designed to return humans to Earth, eclipsing the mark uh, set by the Apollo 13 vehicle back in 1970. After several weeks of flight, it was time for Orion to return home. A half century later, NASA's newest moon explorer, the Orion spacecraft, is barreling its way back home after circumnavigating the moon and beyond in an elliptical distant retrograde orbit. 
now less than two hours away from splashing down in the Pacific Ocean, west of Baja, California, to complete its shakedown mission. Like the Apollo missions of the past, Orion will have to endure incredibly high temperatures during re-entry of Earth's atmosphere. A journey that began uh, with the power of the launch of the Space Launch System 25 and a half days ago, about uh, to reach its final minutes in the searing heat of re-entry, where temperatures around Orion will build up to 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. While re-entering Earth's atmosphere, the spacecraft slowed to about 300 miles per hour. As it continued its descent, Orion's parachute system, containing 11 total parachutes, deployed once it reached approximately 9,000 feet and a speed of about 130 miles per hour. And there it is, high over the Pacific, America's new ticket to ride to the moon and beyond now in view. Orion under its chutes descending towards splashdown. These parachutes help slow the crew module to a much more manageable speed, roughly 20 miles per hour, for a water landing off the coast of California. Splashdown. From Tranquility Base to Taurus Litro to the tranquil waters of the Pacific, the latest chapter of NASA's journey to the moon comes to a close. Orion, back on Earth. The popping noise that you guys heard is the RCS firing. We've got a perfect view, a front row seat to the Orion splashdown. And it's simply beautiful out here. That is a human rated capsule that went around the moon yep. and returned and is now in the Pacific Ocean. I think I can speak for the whole dive team that we're honored to be part of history and be part of something so monumentous and just ready, just ready and excited to go out and do this. When Orion was deemed safe to approach, team members jumped into the water and attached hardware that steadied the capsule. What we do at NASA it really is all about collaborations and the collaborations that we've had with the uh, Department of, the De of Defense in particular over the past uh, many, many years, their hard work and their dedication as they uh, went through a great deal of planning um, hardware development and processes and a lot of practicing uh, to get to this point and make it uh, look easy. And that team, made of a combination of NASA and Department of Defense personnel, has put in years of work to make um, sure that they were ready. If Jones, Starship lands in one piece, they'll just, try to get uh, it. came from outside the ship's control center where she was uh, monitoring and, of course, uh, managing her team in the midst of this recovery. So, Melissa, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. It's just been a, a long time coming. We've been working this mission for a while, and we've done cool. a ton of training. And every time you do training with a mock-up capsule, you don't have any of that. You don't have parachutes. You don't... You know, here coming back to the atmosphere, the sonic booms and all of that kind of stuff. And today that actually happened. Uh, it's just amazing. I didn't realize how big those Navy boats that <clears throat> are that recovered Orion. Dude, they carry you know, an mission, entire battalion of Marines and this team inside exceeded of them. Yeah, all they're, they're expectations. For the last 25 and a half days, we've been every day looking ahead to the next flight to see how we can improve on where we are today so that we can fly a safe and successful mission with our astronauts next time around. They made the service module for Orion convalesce. Once stabilized, the team secured the spacecraft with hardware and rope assemblies and towed it to the Navy ship. The dive team then connected Orion to a series of ropes from inside the back of the ship, known as the well deck, to safely and securely we watched all this live, dude. Inside. Remember when they cut the cast and we watched NASA space flight for the rest of it? <clears throat> three and three. With Orion safely secured inside the ship, teams made their way to Naval Base San Diego where the capsule was offloaded and prepped for its cross-country trip back to its home base, Kennedy Space Center. This is 
really the start of a campaign of, of several missions uh, to, to, to get uh, humans back to the moon and beyond to Mars. So there's still a lot to be done, and, and this is just- End of 2024. Uh, Kennedy uh, just uh, stunned everybody with the Apollo generation. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out. And said that we were going sending to achieve a man what we to the moon was impossible. And returning him safely to of the landing earth. Landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. Many things have happened since, but we knew we were going back. Oh, this is the, the nice. program of going back to the moon to learn, to live, to invent, to create in order to explore beyond. So it's, it's a new day. A new day has dawned, and Artemis generation is taking us there. This is really good. That's really good. Cool. Yeah, that was a good video to start Space News on. So, Space News. That's basically where we're talking about what's going on. That was a, a documentary that, or like a little docu thingamajigger that uh, that NASA put out about the Artemis 1 mission. We watched most of that, dude. We watched both moon transits that it did and re-entry, obviously launched, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, thank you for bringing back Space News. Finally missed the streams. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no problem. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the second SLS is set to launch uh, pretty much at they're they're aiming for December 2024. Um why is it taking so long? Well, that mission yielded a lot of data. Uh, you know, they, that was a law. It was a pretty long duration mission for something that wasn't going to the space station. Uh, and basically, what they're doing is they're combing through all all the telemetry and all the data that they got from that first mission. And not only are they, you know, learning from said data, but they're using it and applying it to the second, to the next mission, the one that's going to have people on it. Components are reused out of that Orion capsule that flew on Artemis 1, and a lot of the components from the inside of that capsule will be no used on the Artemis 2 capsule because, you know, reused components are... Reused components is good. Can I get a link for that video for reasons? It was a good video. Um, I hope this helps us pull together instead of trying to make life's wor life wor worse for others. Well... Aqualux, something that I've been trying to do, and I, I don't know, I kind of picked up on this post-pandemic. Something I've been trying to do is to not try to bring people together more than doing anything else. I mean, look at look at this chat. There's people, there's all kinds of people in here. You know what I mean? Overseas, here in the States, you know, look, we... <laughs> Being at each other's throats is not, that's not going to get us anywhere. You know what I mean? It's not going to, that ain't going to get us nowhere. You know? And instead of people spouting out all the time, like, you know, it's okay to disagree, you know, blah, blah. We disagree on this and that's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's fine to disagree, but you know what's really nice? Agreeing with each other about things. You know what I mean? And I think the one thing that anybody can get behind is the space program. You don't even have to be American to get behind what we do. It's pretty inspiring stuff, you know? So, I've been trying to just focus on the stuff that makes everybody happy. And roll with it, you know? You know, I, that's easier to do. You know, uh, I'm trying to put out the flames, not not put fuel on the fire, you know what I mean? Bad Harry Jack, 16 month resub. So, I agree. Generally, the world is better. We transport these people down. Yeah, everyone does it, man. Everyone does it. It's like it's become a societal norm. It doesn't matter who you are. Like, and I, dude, it just, you know, like, as I get older, that behavior drives me up the wall. You know why it drives me up the wall? Because I know it's not, it's not, we're treading water. Treading water, man. Flyboy, look at the video around 1332. 
When it's on the truck, it looks like a chunk of the bottom of the heat shield is missing. Oh, okay. Discovery, go at throttle. Thirteen thirty-two. All right. Hey, ten sixty-four and monkey head with a nine niner. Thank you. All right, let's take a look. And once Starship launches, SLS would be dethroned. Well, T-Man, that's the one thing, you know, like, I don't know what it's going to dethrone, but whatever, like, as I don't understand, we basically have the best of both worlds. We have Saturn V and the Space Shuttle. The Space Shuttle 2.0 coexisting at one time. They're working on getting us back to the moon and to Mars. That's pretty freaking cool, dude. All right, so what are we looking at here? That was a U.S. tug of war team. Yeah, pull this capsule in. You say you're trying to put out the flames. Aren't the flames kind of what you want when talking about rockets? Good point. <clears throat> you seem to be okay with good enough for a while. No, no, no. I'm with you. I'm with you, Aqualex. I think. <laughs> I think one thing that everyone can agree can agree on is that you know. Should take it to the next level. Uh, yeah, no, we're pretty, we're all exceptionalists, man. <laughs> Whether we like to admit it or not. <laughs> all right, so chunk of the heat shield missing. Let's see. You talking about that right there? Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think that's. I mean, don't get me wrong. NASA's probably, NASA probably has like four or five scientists looking at this thing, going, "Hmm, the size and shape of this is very, very peculiar." I'm sure they do. Not, no mental stone unturned. Nothing. Figure out why that happened. That's how you rocket science. No bullcrap. No excuses. Figure out why it did that. Now, we do know that Orion's heat shield deformed in a way that was previously uh, not seen when it came back from the moon. Uh, it was within margins. Like Obviously, the capsule made it back. But the, the heat shield did something slightly different than what they thought it was going to do. That's deviant engineering, and that needs to be taken into account. NASA needs to figure out why the heat shield burned in a way that they didn't that they didn't understand, right? So, like, think about it like this if we want to reduce it to its base element, right? I take this and I drop it. You know what's going to happen five out of five times. But maybe I turn it a little bit and drop it again, and it maybe it falls and bounces in a slightly different way. If I drop this thing the exact same way, in the exact same conditions, five out of five times, it's going to do the same exact thing. But sometimes it might bounce in a different direction, right? Maybe I didn't drop it at the right time. Maybe my release mechanism wasn't right. There's little differences that are going to make it bounce slightly different every time. And <laughs> say one of the times I drop it and it bounces off the ground and comes back up into my hand. Well, that definitely isn't something you expected it to do. And that behavior needs to be understood. You need to understand why it did that. It, maybe I didn't drop it right. Maybe I threw it at the ground instead of dropping it, right? You got to understand these little differences. That's really what it takes to do a rock, like get rocket science correct. You can apply that logic to Kerbal, right? And that's why I was going on the other day when we were making landing legs. I was going on about how it's inconsistent. It's an incons inconsistent simulation right now. It's something different happens every time, no matter what I do. Even if I do the same thing over and over and over again, even if I didn't change anything and it's hard to engineer something when, you know, I go to drop this thing one time it falls onto the ground. Like I'm expecting, I drop it again and it goes up <laughs> and let it go. And it goes, whoop, you know, you can see me through the can. I don't think you can. What was the re-entry speed of Orion, of the Orion capsule, compared to the shuttle? Orion hit the atmosphere going about 25,000 miles an hour. The shuttle hits the atmosphere going about 20,000 miles an hour. You must understand, it is not the can that is dropping, but it is in fact, it, but it is in fact yourself. There is no can. Don't try to make the can float. That's impossible. Dang, hell, EJ and community, quick question. 
KSB2, is there a workaround for the camera bug where the camera no longer focuses on the ship? Try hitting home, Dank. Try hitting the home key. If not, uh, move your mouse over over a part so it highlights and double click. It'll switch. It'll it'll try to switch back. Other than that, no. I know there's there's some kind of glitch going on with separation systems where it separates, but the game doesn't think it's separated. So it, your spacecraft kind of floats away, and the part you separated kind of floats away, and the camera just stays in the center. I don't know how to I don't know how to fix that problem. Chroma to dry. Oh, yeah, bud. How would tile ablation affect Starship Rapid Cadence? Tiles don't ablate. They absorb heat. Tiles are not an ablative heat shield. They can absorb... They can abs Basically, the amount of heat they, they can absorb exceeds the amount of heat that would be encountered on a re-entry trajectory. Think about it... So, Erudite, energy is quantitative. Quantitative. It does... There's, it's called the law of conservation of energy. So, okay. Say I have a bottle of water, right? I have a liter of liter of water in a can, right? And then I have an empty can that's also one liter. Take the water, pour it in the can. Now, assuming you did it slowly, right, and didn't splash water everywhere, you will have the exact same amount of water in this as this, right? You know... You might, it might be like minusculely different because of like humidity or temperature or whatever, right? But it's, you know, barring like a something, you know, me missing and spilling it everywhere, right? It's going to be the exact same. Energy works exactly like that. So, the tiles can absorb energy. They're good at absorbing thermal energy. They can absorb a lot of it. They can absorb a lot of thermal energy. Uh, so... Think about it when the spacecraft is going, when Starship or the space shuttle is going through re-entry, right? The tiles are heating up, but it's only for 10 to 15 minutes, right? You're heating up going through re-entry, but it's only, you know, you get through peak heating after about eight minutes, right? And then you make it through peak heating and the tiles start cooling off, right? But think about it like this. Now, what's the, what's cooling off the tiles? The, the atmosphere. Well, the cooler atmosphere is going to cool off the tiles way more than the plasma would. But in the time that you're heating up these tiles, just like me pouring a glass of water into another cup, you're heating it up. You're filling up the tile with heat. The tile can take it. Basically, the tile can take it. It can take it just fine. If, if Once again, my liter, liter of water into an empty liter of water can there you go you have one that's full and one that's empty you pour it into the other one the tile can take all that heat it can absorb all of it the total amount of time the total amount of heat energy that the tile can absorb is probably rated way past way past uh what you'd encounter during re-entry from mars knowing spacex because think about it right this thing's the starship's ideally designed to go to mars and come back obviously that's what it's designed to do so let's say that if we're, once again, we'll just, water is easier to understand. So like, it's easier to understand, like if you can see something, right? So say the, uh, the amount of heat energy that gets absorbed by said tile is equivalent to two liters of water. All right. This is, this is a stupid analogy. Just bear with me. All right. So if you, you know, you, your tile here, the amount it can absorb right? It needs to be able to absorb two liters. The tile can hold like eight. So even if you take the two liters of water and pour it into your bottle tile, right? It can hold eight liters of water. That's why the tiles work because they can absorb insane amounts of heat and the total amount of heat that they can absorb, it, it gets nowhere near it during re-entry. That's why, that's why the tiles are reusable. Because they can absorb insane amounts of heat. And that's why we keep using them. Because they're a really good system. Because tiles are really light. They, they're they really not a lot of mass. The tiles though can't absorb water. That's one problem the shuttle had when returning. Especially with the glue. <laughs> that's... Yeah, you're right. But... Jesus... Did you see that Herd is live? Oh, that's cool, Mercs. Right on.
Technically, the tiles don't absorb the heat. They spread it out. Mm. That looks a lot like absorbing heat to me, Cerebral. Oh, yeah, also that guy's touching it. No, that doesn't have an LED inside of it. It is literally like 1600C, but you could touch the edges of it. Yeah, tiles are a pretty interesting piece of material science right there. Those are the silica tiles from the shuttle. Those aren't, in, those aren't even the tough rock tiles that are on um, the unifibrous reinforced tiles that are on Starship. I see. Look at how much heat that thing can absorb. But the heat still comes out. It's spread out in time. You're talking about flux, not... Okay, so you're... Sorry, Bill, you're describing heat flux. Heat flux is not the same thing as the total amount of heat that something can absorb. You can absorb the heat. Absorbing the heat is quantitative, right? Heat flux is how fast it does it. You're right. The tiles can flux heat very, very quickly. They can absorb a crazy amount really quick and shed it off really, really fast. Yes, that's correct. But f don't confuse flux with total amount of, with critical mass, right? Like, don't, th those aren't the same thing. A am I wrong? I'm pretty sure those aren't the same thing. Specific heat. That's what it's called. Specific heat, not critical mass. Thank you, self. Yeah, that's right. Pretty cool though, right? But yeah, energy is quantitative. And it, the, Erudite, another thing to learn about energy is that energy doesn't go anywhere. It's always addition. So if you have two megajoules of energy, right? And you add another two megajoules of energy, you get four megajoules of energy, okay? So if you have an electric motor, right? Think about it like this. You have an electric motor and you have a battery and your battery has four megajoules of energy or yeah, let's just say that. And you use all four megajoules of energy by stepping on the gas on your electric car. You've taken that electrical energy and you've made it into mechanical work. And that mechanical work manifests itself as kinetic energy of making the car move. Now, don't get me wrong. There's diminishing forces here. You're going to encounter electrical resistance in the wire. You're going to encounter, encounter rolling resistance on the tires. You're going to encounter overcoming moment, basically getting, using some of that energy to get the thing up to speed, right? And all that zaps energy away. So if you, even, even if you have a battery that has four megajoules of energy in it and you use that by stepping on the gas in your electric car, you're never going to get four megajoules of energy towards your speed. You, which is the other thing. Energy is always a diminishing return. You never get out what you put in, ever. It's always a losing battle. Also drag from air. Yep, bingo. Air resistance, yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of that is lost due to aerodynamic drag. Some of it's lost due to rolling resistance from the tires. Some of it's lost due to electrical resistance from the wires that the electricity actually goes through. And then it all turns into heat at one point. Yeah, there you go, truck. Yep. Yeah, Uncle Lex, the, the, the idea is, yeah, if you imagine it that way, I mean, that works too. But yeah, energy is quantitative. It always, it never goes away. Energy just doesn't fade into nothingness, right? It does fade into the air. That happens all the time. That happens all the time if you own a car with an internal combustion engine on it. It has a radiator on it for a reason. Because a byproduct of making an explosion to get that piston to, to, to make gases expand to push that piston down is heat from the explosion. Yeah. In internal combustion engines, some of that energy is used to make an explosion. Some of the energy from said explosion is used to push that piston down, but a lot of that energy from the explosion gets transmitted as heat energy and makes your engine hot. That's why engines have a radiator. AKA mostly wasted energy. That's, but see, that's, that's physics, man. Such a pain in the butt. You all, you always lose. You always lose.
there's no i mean that's more that's more laws of thermodynamics not necessarily conservation of energy but that's one of the laws of thermodynamics so you get what i'm trying to say yeah of course aquilex yep Sorry, I didn't mean to be that guy. I just mean the energy doesn't stay in the tile. It comes out. Yeah, yeah. You're talking about heat flux. No, you, Cerebral, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. That's not... You didn't... You well actually mean, but you didn't well actually mean the way that you thought you were going to well actually mean, if that makes any sense. You're you're right. You're correct. We we're just talking about a slightly different thing, but you're absolutely right. In the end, gravity always wins. Well, yeah, gravity's pretty... Dan, <laughs> gravity is... Pretty annoying, especially if you're a rocket scientist, to, to say the least. It's pretty freaking annoying. <laughs> it's pretty freaking annoying, dude. But also, Earth's crazy gravity well is kind of why we exist, or at least one of the reasons. Yeah, we kind of... It's a double-edged sword, you know what I mean? But anyway... Mm -hmm. Yeah, the second I realized that energy is kind of quantitative, it helped you really you really understand physics a lot better that way. <laughs> I really wish my teacher had said that. But then again, my teachers in high school and middle school probably did say that. I probably wasn't paying attention. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, your boy probably was not paying attention. I was probably drawing pictures of spacecraft in my notebook, ironically. Everything is quantitative. That's the whole thing about quantum physics. Yeah, that's right. That's You know what? That's a good point. <laughs> You're not wrong. Is there any ETA for Starship? So violent... Everybody was kind of... Uh, there were signs... Not everybody. There were signs that were pointing towards the, the Starship orbital launch being on the 10th. But I don't think that's going to happen. Um, there were marine traffic notices on the 10th, 11th, and 12th. And... We did see the FAA ATC advisory say that there would be an attempt for a Starship launch on the 10th, 11th, or the 12th. But here's the thing. SpaceX is not launching unless they have a launch license from the Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, and don't get me wrong. They wouldn't put Starship. They would not put Starship out on the pad like they did today and test the umbilicals test the umbilicals for Starship and stack it on top of Super Heavy if that process wasn't coming to a close and they were about to get awarded a launch license. However, however, they can schedule all the dates that they want. If they don't have the launch license, they ain't going. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the marine traffic notices being issued and the uh, ATC notifications for launches saying that SpaceX is going to launch soon, that doesn't necessarily mean that those are wrong. Why so many trucks with fuel to do not happen in day, day 10? Okay. Next question. Except your mom got him. Oh, 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 oh. So Starship tiles could be reused near infinitely, or is it just a slow decay? They can be used as many times as you want, Erudite. Yeah. Yeah, they can be... Yeah, exactly. The lifetime of the tile should be comparable to the lifetime of the whole vehicle. Bingo, Cerebral. Yeah, you got it, dude. So, I was kind of curious about what I was looking at about this. I was looking at some close-up shuttle shots, and I noticed the shuttle tiles had small spaces. Why is that, and why is it also on Starship? Uh, the spaces between the tiles T-Man on Starship and the space shuttle are there to account for thermal expansion. Interesting thing. We were talking about heat a second ago. When stuff absorbs heat... So think about like if you have a balloon, right? When stuff absorbs heat, it expands. If you have a balloon, you blow it up with air, it expands. Heat will make stuff expand. It'll First of all, temperature, right? It'll make gases expand pretty easily, right? <laughs> that's why it's, you know, hotter when you're in the sun all day. But that's another story. Um, so metal will expand when it absorbs heat. So thermal contractions and expansions happen. So when you're going through reentry, the metal, the metal hull of the space shuttle, the aluminum hull of the space shuttle will expand. And Starship is the same way. It will expand as well. 
And when it does expand, the tiles start absorbing heat and they expand too and it fills up the gap. Yeah. The tiles at a certain temperature will start expanding and they'll butt up against each other. Because they can absorb an insane amount of heat, can't they? That's why there's little tiny creases in between each tile. So the, the whole ship is going to expand and the tiles are going to expand too. And getting those two expansion rates correct is super important. They got it right on the first try with the shuttle with 33,000 tiles attached. And not much in the way of computers to help you figure that out. Pretty crazy, right? Hey, just started a 14-day 3D print. Ha 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 ha, I hate myself. Oh, jeez, have fun with that. Do we know anything about how Starship will have radiators? Uh, I don't think SpaceX is even at the point of designing radiators for Starship because there's no point in designing a radiator up on orbit atomic if you can't get into orbit, right? I think that's how SpaceX is doing that. Won't the tanks still be cold-ish from the fuel? Um, well, the fuel will be inside of the header tanks inside of the tanks, Mason, so no, probably not. I feel like that implies that the tile spacing would need to be different for different missions. A Mars return should heat more than a lunar return. No, negative, Squishy. Total impulse is always the same. Y yeah, to get from on orbit... To down back onto the surface, uh, you're always going to absorb the exact same amount of heat because you're flying through the same atmospheric medium. Yeah, it's always going to be the same. Now, how quickly that happens is what will change. So, if you're on a steeper trajectory, right? Or if you're coming back from the moon as opposed to coming back from orbit, you will see a higher temperature, absolutely, but you will absorb the same amount of energy. Interesting, right? Yeah. Weird. So, yeah, what we're talking about here is a little bit of material science, but, yeah, material science is always a good time. A ballistic trajectory with the tiles would be interesting. I mean, interest yeah, it'd be interesting, team man if you like dying. <laughs> would different atmospheres change that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, of course, Pop-Tart. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about on Earth. On Earth, it's always going to be the same. On Earth. On Mars, oh yeah, it's completely different. But it's a it's a completely different number of energy because the atmosphere isn't as big, right? But, however, um, that number will still be the same no matter what trajectory you come back from. It's just, once again, it's the total, it's the total max temperature that changes. You're on a steeper trajectory or you're coming in on a shallow trajectory at a higher speed your your period of heating will be shorter and the temperature will be higher but it'll be the same amount of energy as a shallow trajectory right shallow trajectory longer re-entry lower peak heating so the shuttle for instance flies on a very very shallow trajectory because the tiles the tiles can't take a really really high temperature but they can absorb an insane amount of heat over time they can stay at like 300 degrees, four, five, six, seven hundred 700 degrees, no problem. Just make it right through. As long as your total temperature, right, isn't too high. Does logic work like the bigger you are from re-entry, the slower you go? Like would Starship 100 times bigger slow down more? It's all about mass, erudite, mass. And that goes to Newton's third law. Force equals mass times acceleration, okay? So, Starship has a lot more mass than, say, a brick, right? Starship, because it has more mass, right, it's going to be harder to stop. It has more force behind it because it's an acceler... It, it, it's, it's a... Acceleration being applied at times a much bigger mass. Now, what you're talking about there is you're taking into account, you have to take into account some aerodynamics there. So, coefficient of drag and ballistic coefficient. So, coefficient of drag basically is how much, 
How much surface area is pushing air out of the way? That's the plain English way of saying it, okay? Like how much air is being moved out of the way by your surfaces that are encountering laminar flow. So basically the front. How much air does the front of your spacecraft move out of the way or your heat shield in this particular case? The other thing is ballistic coefficient. Ballistic coefficient is the ratio, is the volume of it, the volume of the entire vehicle. Uh, it's the ratio of the volume to the mass of the vehicle. So something like Starship weighs hundreds of tons. So it's going to come in with a lot of momentum and it's going to take a lot to slow it down. The atmosphere can do it if you're shallow enough and if you fly on a super shallow trajectory, right, with Starship, it will, the heating period will be longer and your overall temperature will be lower, but it will be able to take it. Now, if you have something that's the size of a Starship that weighs one, instead of like 250 tons, you have something that weighs like maybe 100 tons. 100 tons, it's going to be, it's going to slow down a little bit faster. But once again, total energy, the total energy absorbed will always be the same, which is very interesting, right? It's the speed that denotes temperature. Are you ready for some pain? Maybe a weird question, but why are rockets round and not square? A pillar is the easiest way to hold something up, Violent. Or the strongest way, I should say. Pillars are the strongest strongest thing. Because you get uniform force pushing out on all sides of the circle. Rockets are like that for a reason. If you had a rocket that was square, shaped like this, the pressure pointing out on this will be different than the pressure pointing out on this edge, which will be very different from the pressure pointing out here. It's the same reason why the Greeks use... Like when they made the Parthenon, they used a bunch of pillars to hold that whole thing up. Pillars are the strongest, the pillar, so cylinders, right, are very strong at taking compression load. They can be squished. You don't have to worry about them bending and breaking. How many miles will Starship cover in re-entry? Uh, a lot. It'll probably begin re-entry somewhere over, like, the Philippines and be in Hawaii in, like, five minutes. <laughs> then the puppy who lost his way. Yep. Also see hydro forming, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, there you go, Terminator. That's not true at all. You have more kinetic energy. Squishy, then why the hell did you ask me the question? If you knew the answer to it, why did you ask me? Come on, guys. There's a freaking migraine here. <laughs> like, dude, you got you to gotta cut me some slack on that one. If I said a couple of things backwards with how re-entry heating works, I apologize. I'm sorry. It's it's hard to think straight with with my like basically my head stuck in a vice. <laughs> 